pray. And Lord, as we um, open your word, we trust that you will speak to us. We say our ears are open, our heart is open, God. We're ready to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, sit down. Grab your Bibles. Get comfy. Not too comfy. Don't fall asleep. It's too early in the week to be falling asleep after worship. All right, y'all. My name is Deacon Katie. And this is my first time at Soul in the City. Will you raise your hand if this is your first time at Soul in the City? Raise your hand if it's your first time at Soul in the City. Okay, raise your hand if it's your second time. Anybody's second time? Anybody's third time? Are you calculating, Jenny? Fourth? Fifth? Sixth? A dozen. Do you win, Nick? What? How many, how many have you been to? Uh, how many years have you been doing? I don't, I don't know. Seven. Jenny says seven. Well, it's, it's, my, it's my first year. I came last year and, and got to preach to you guys one evening, but this, this time I'm here the whole time. So I'm really excited to get to know a lot of you, I hope, uh, especially those who are coming to the work site with me, but also just hanging out here. I'm really excited to, to get to know each of you more. Uh, if you didn't know, we start planning and praying for Soul in the City in like, I don't know, January? Or, or last year, as soon as last year's Soul in the City ended, we already started praying for what God would have for this year's Soul in the City. But we have been praying and planning and anticipating this week for a lot of months now. So some of you didn't even know that you were coming here until your parents were like, hey, it's time to start packing for Soul in the City. Some of you have been really excited about it for several weeks, several months, but it is no accident that you're here, that you're part of this week. So um, yeah, just be ready, be expectant for what God is gonna do. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. I serve at Hope Point, um, just north of here, and I'm married to Father Michael, the lesser, right? The greater. <laughs> and Father Michael, the lesser, is the godfather of my, my youngest. So we're all connected. I have a four-year-old and a three-year-old, two boys named Joey and Elliot. And uh, Michael and I have the joy of leading the youth group at Hope Point together. So I'm really excited to be here with a handful of our students this week. Um, the theme for Soul in the City 2022 is Calming the Storm. This comes directly from scripture. So I want you to open your Bibles with me now to Mark chapter four. Mark, Mark four, Jenny. The gospel of Mark chapter four. Okay. Everybody there, gospel of Mark chapter four. We're gonna start in verses 35. I'll read this to you. <clears throat> Are we there? Mark 4, verse 35. On that day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? The word of the Lord. So where are we in the Bible? Some of you are still finding it. We are in the Gospel of Mark. 
which is the second gospel out of how many? We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. This is the gospel of Mark, and it is the fastest paced out of all the gospels. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of movement. We're only in chapter four, and Jesus has already gathered his disciples, is teaching the crowds. He's on the move. The Gospel of Mark actually starts with him as a fully grown adult, ready to come be baptized. This isn't like Luke, where we get to see him being born and everything. Gospel of Mark jumps right in. So that tells us something already about this story. There's action, there's movement. Look at chapter 4. What's the context of the chapter we're in? Jesus is teaching a crowd in parables. Let's read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. So I want you to imagine that this is the beach, and that this is the boat in the water, and Jesus is here teaching, and you guys are the crowd on the beach, sitting in the sand maybe. So this is kind of the spatial setup that we have, Jesus in the boat, I think so that he didn't get crushed by the crowd. He needed a little distance. So there's some waves and a nice sandy beach between us. You're the crowd all gathered there listening to Jesus teach. And you're listening closely to what this man has for you. He's teaching in parables. Some of the parables that he's teaching, the parable of the sower, the lamp under a basket, the parable of the seed growing, the parable of the mustard seed, some of the really famous ones. But after the first parable, we see him kind of giving an aside to his disciples, to his inner circle, explaining to them why he teaches in parables. So I want you to look down at verses 10 through 12. We're still in Mark 4. And in my Bible, there's actually a little subtitle that says the purpose of the parables. So if you want to know why Jesus is teaching in parables, let's look here. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Jesus' disciples could only understand what he was teaching them through parables because the Holy Spirit had given them that ability had given them spiritual eyes, spiritual ears, spiritual hearts to hear the stories that he was telling, which are connected to, I mean, seeds and sowing. It was the things of everyday, ordinary life that they were really familiar with. He's teaching them in this memorable, rich imagery, connected to daily life, regular experiences. Think about some of the sermons that you've heard. Some of, even think about like history class lectures that you've heard, and what are the bits and pieces that you remember the most when you're asked the next day or when your mom picks you up and is like, what'd you learn about? The things that you remember the most are those really um, memorable stories, right? With rich imagery. So that's a lot like what Jesus is doing with the crowd and that's why he's teaching in this way. Okay, so what's happening with this storm? A long day of teaching, the crowds has ended. It's time to go to the other side. It's evening, kind of like this time now. Jesus stays in the same boat that he'd been teaching from, which was large enough to hold about 15 people. It held 12 more comfortably, but it could hold about 15. So it was pretty crowded in there. Other boats were coming along with him. When they departed, the weather probably looked fine. These were really experienced fishermen. So if they had anticipated a big storm coming, they would not have set sail. Their livelihood was spent on the Sea of Galilee. They knew what was safe and was not safe. So they decided, sure, it's a safe time. We're going to go ahead and go across. The skies look fine. The wind is favorable. So it would have taken them about two hours to get from one side of the Sea of Galilee across to the other. Not that long. Sometimes we think that they were sailing all night. It really was only a two-hour sail from one side to the other. So some really smart people like geographers and Bible historians and people who know a lot about fishermen in the days of Jesus, all these smart people say that this storm 
may not have been thunder and lightning and torrents of rain and huge waves that we so often imagine. Have you ever seen like a painting or an artistic description, depiction of Jesus calming the storm? It's usually like this massive boat that's tilted halfway over. There's like lightning coming from the sky and a tidal wave about to crash over the entire boat. Can you imagine that in your head? Or even think of movie scenes where you see that kind of storm and you know that the ship is like about to flip over. You know what I'm talking about? Scholars actually say that with this storm, it might have actually looked a little different. With the weight of the boat and the size of this type of fishing boat, the size of the boat, which, what's the size of a boat called, Carson? I don't know. Was only about one foot over the surface of the water. Okay, so they're, clo they're sitting down like very low into the water. This is just a fishing boat and there are a lot of people in it, so it's weighing it down. Like think about, yeah, think about how it would be weighing down the boat. They're pretty close. Like they could just reach their arm over the side and brush the surface of the water. So with this spontaneous wind that came over the mountains and started churning up the waters, this spontaneous windstorm that they couldn't have anticipated by looking at the skies, it was churning up the water enough that it definitely produced waves big enough to come over the sides of the boat, right? If it's only 12 inches above the surface of the water. A windstorm coming is creating these waves that even if they're not massive tidal waves, they're still big enough to come over the edge of the boat. So what do we do when we see water start coming over the edge of the boat? Panic. Panic. Yes. You're like, who's got a bucket? We got to scoop some of this water out. More and more waves coming over the edge of the boat. This might also explain a little bit why Jesus was able to sleep through this. Do you ever think like, how was he still napping? during the middle of a storm. Well, he was probably tired. He'd just been teaching the crowds all day. But if he's asleep and the boat is filling with water, the disciples are certainly freaking out. Uh, there's panic growing. They see that the boat is getting swamped, that it's probably gonna start sinking. Again, this is different than an all of a sudden lightning is striking and massive tidal waves come over their heads while Jesus somehow remains asleep. I personally resonate with this kind of storm more. It's not the, ah, we're gonna die, Jesus, save us, kind of storm. Now, those do happen, literally. We live in Houston, we know what hurricanes are like. But also in life, um, it's usually massive tragedies, unusually frightening experiences, trauma. I know those do happen, they've happened in a lot of your lives. And those storms are real, and Jesus speaks to them. He speaks to those waves. But this storm that we're looking at here in Mark 4, the slowly over time feeling like I might be about to drown, like I can't work hard enough to scoop the water out of the boat, feeling more and more panicked and overwhelmed and helpless as wave after wave comes over the edge of the boat, those kinds of storms are a little more common in our lives. They look like anxiety, loneliness, despair, worry, jealousy, insecurity, temptation and addiction, fear of the unknown, of what's ahead. They look like the human experience of every single person who is apart from Jesus every day, nonstop, wave after wave coming into the boat, threatening to sink it. So what does Jesus do? Let's look at verse 39 in Mark 4. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Jesus is the sovereign creator, ruler of all. He brings order and beauty and peace out of the chaotic, empty, swirling, dark abyss of nothingness. That is how he's able to speak to the wind and the water and they obey him. Genesis 1, 1 through 2, you don't need to turn there, but listen. In the beginning, God created what? 
the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, the waters of chaos and nothingness. And he brings order and beauty out of that. John 1, 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Who's the Word? Jesus. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus was with God from the beginning, creating all things. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then listen to this. This comes from Psalm 89, verses 8 through 9. This draws directly to Mark 4. It says, O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Jesus speaks to the chaos. Just like we see in Genesis 1 and John 1, there is calm, quiet, stillness, peace, And he doesn't just speak in any casual way. Did you notice what verb it uses about how he speaks to the wind and the waves? Rebuke. He rebukes the wind and the waves. To rebuke means to express sharp disapproval or criticism of someone, or in this case, something, because of their behavior or actions. You know who else gets rebuked in scripture a lot? Satan and demons. And here we see Jesus rebuking the wind and the waves. Then, after he speaks to the ocean, he turns to the disciples and says, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Okay, well, let's remember why they were afraid the water was coming over the sides of the boat. That seems like a valid reason for them to be freaking out. They were a mile or more from shore. They were face to face with sinking, drowning, dying, but, They weren't in the boat alone, were they? Jesus, the Lord of life, their Messiah, their creator, was with them. Jesus is not invalidating that drowning is scary. He's not saying drowning, no big deal, you guys. It is terrifying. He's saying that there is nothing to fear when he is there. There is nothing to fear when you have faith. So what do we learn from this? Why is this passage the theme for Soul in the City 2022. Jesus offers three things in this passage. I want you to say them after me. Calm. Calm. Say it again. Calm. Calm. Rest. Rest. Faith. Faith. We're going to learn about each of these by looking at their opposites. What do you think is the opposite of calm? Panic. What about chaos? Calm versus chaos. Jesus brings order out of chaos, peace in the midst of the storms of life. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So throughout this week, in your prayers and in the rest of the teaching, be listening for how Jesus brings calm in the midst of chaos. Second, what's the opposite of rest? Restlessness, unrest, okay, good. Anything else? Exhaustion, yeah. Okay, you know what I put for the opposite of rest? Freaking out. What the disciples are doing. Jesus, instead, offers rest in the midst of the storms of life. In fact, what is he doing as the disciples are freaking out? Not just resting. He's napping. He's asleep. Listen to Matthew 11:28 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The disciples were working and striving and worrying and freaking out while Jesus was resting. Throughout this week, in your prayers and in the rest of the teaching, be listening for how Jesus offers rest while the rest of the world is freaking out. Last, faith. What's the opposite of faith? It's right here in this passage. What's the opposite of faith? What does Jesus say to them? Why are you still so afraid? Fear. 
faith versus fear. The spirit produces faith where there was fear. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, we will not be afraid. So throughout this week, in your prayers and in the rest of the teaching, be listening, especially in our morning devotions, when we look at some of the Psalms. I want you especially there to be listening for how Jesus removes our fear by his very presence. He replaces it with, faith. He is not saying that the things that scare us aren't scary. He says we don't need to fear because he is with us. We can trust him. We can put our faith in him. So three things to remember this week. Calm versus chaos. Rest versus freaking out. Faith versus fear. All three of these things are wrapped up in this wild story about Jesus calming the storm. And the last thing I want to share with you, and this is so appropriate after the game we played, is that as we prepare to sail ahead into this week that God has for us, we are all on the boat together. That's the beautiful thing about the church, about the people of God, is that our community of faith, and this week your community of faith is the people who are here at Soul in the City with you. Our community of faith is like an unsinkable boat in the middle of the chaotic storms of this life. Much like Noah's ark that protected God's chosen people from a great destructive flood, we are on a boat with Jesus sailing together. There is peace and rest aboard this boat this week. That does not mean that the journey is always going to be peaceful. There might even be storms. There might even be waves coming over the side of the boat that we think might sink us. But we can trust that Jesus is Lord and in him there is peace. Let's pray. Oh, Father, as we spend a little bit more time in worship, would you just solidify in our hearts that you are the giver of peace. You are the one who gives us rest, and we only can have faith by the Spirit producing it in us. So Lord, I ask for myself, for each of these students, for each of these volunteers, that you would fill us with greater faith. Teach us to trust you, God. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.